All right, good morning and welcome everyone to the 2021 Ken Shine Prize Lecture honoring Dr. Anthony Fauci. We're thrilled to have so many join us from around the world for what promises to be an exciting event. Thank you for joining us here and we're here to recognize the American hero and partake in a fascinating conversation about the future. Since 2016, the Ken Shine Prize has been awarded to those who have made significant leadership advancements in health. This year's recipient is Dr. Anthony S. Fauci and deservedly so. Dr. Fauci, over the last year, you've showed incredible resilience and patience. You've deployed tact, eloquence, and authority in the service of your country. You've made an incredibly complex ideas and concepts easier for Americans to understand. And ultimately, you've made an incredibly difficult situation better than it might have been. I can think of no better person to receive this award. We like to say here at UT, what starts here changes the world. And you are the embodiment of that goal that we embrace. You're a role model for our students who are here to gain the skills they need to change the world, and in particular, to transform healthcare in America. In short, thank you for your outstanding service, and of course, welcome virtually to the University of Texas at Austin. Today, we're going to discuss what comes after the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a conversation we can have in 2021 because of the leadership shown by Dr. Fauci and others. Before I transition to Clay and give a more formal introduction of the event and Dr. Fauci, I wanna take a moment and thank everyone in the UT Austin community for your contributions to the COVID-19 effort. I'd especially like to call out the work of Dr. Jason McClellan in the Department of Molecular Biosciences for his work on the mRNA vaccine technology that has offered so much hope during these unprecedented difficult times. So with that, I'll hand things over to Dr. Clay Johnston, Dean of the Dell Medical School and Vice President of Medical Affairs here at UT Austin. Dean Johnston will join Dr. Fauci in discussion about our shared future. Over to you, Clay. Great, thank you so much, Jay. Um, Dr. Fauci, what a, what a great pleasure it is to have you here today. Thank you so much uh, for doing this. We know how, how busy you are and we're just really honored by your presence. The, uh, the Ken Shine Prize is, is one that's very special to Dell Medical School. Um, it's the only prize that we get and it's named for someone that I know you know um, and is, who's been a legendary in medicine and he's, he's with us today and gets the honor of asking the final question. Um, so you will, you will see him uh, later. Um, and uh, you know, it's named for uh, uh, Ken, who was the uh, uh, dean of UCLA and then became the, the head of the Institutes of Medicine, um, where he took work on improving quality of care to a whole new level, uh, really uh, you know, famous for To Err as Human, which uh, we're still working on the recommendations and, and uh, To Err as Human. He became uh, subsequently the executive vice chancellor for health at the UT system. Um, in, in that role, I think most importantly, he laid the groundwork and really launched uh, the Dell Medical School, uh, uh, which, uh, which uh, was launched now, what, uh, seven years ago, if you take uh, my tenure as the, as the starting point. Um, the, the prize has been given now, you're the fifth awardee of the prize, and past awardees have been uh, Kathy Drakeup, Carolyn Clancy, Steve Schroeder, and Don Berwick. So you're an excellent company. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, you uh, truly are uh, deserving of this. Uh, we, you know, we'd love to have you come down and visit us, but we recognize that in this year that wouldn't be possible. And that might be the best time actually to bring you down to receive this award. We know you're, you're you know, super busy. We'd love to have you come visit at some point. Um, so people don't know that much about you because when Sanjay Gupta interviews you, he gets directly into the, you know, the vaccine and the questions about it and the, the, the pandemic. So just to say just a few words, um, you, COVID, COVID was not important to you receiving this award. Your lifetime achievements have, have really been unbelievable. Um, uh, you, uh, initi your initial training was at... Uh, at Cornell, and then immediate, pretty much immediately after residency went to NIH, where you've spent your entire career, quickly rose up and uh, have headed the NIAID for 36 years. Uh, I, I, you know, that it's just amazing. And I know you've been offered many, many other jobs, including the, the job of the person you report to um, and have declined those through the years. I think for, for me, you became a hero back in the, in the 80s uh, when I was just beginning my career in, in medicine. Um, and, uh, and there was a, a battle between the activists and the AIDS community and you and your office. And um, 
you did a remarkable job of, of balancing these sort of, uh, I don't know, untouchable premises of, med of medicine and evidence and also recognizing the importance of the voices of the people who are affected by, by HIV and really coming up with some incredibly innovative ways of, of getting therapies to, to people who desperately needed them sooner than otherwise would have been possible. And that flexibility was, was truly uh, remarkable and you became, well, you went from being the, uh, the, the key enemy to being the hero of the activist community um, in the HIV AIDS world and, and are, you know, have been honored repeatedly in that. You've, um, you won the LASPER award um, and you also won the Presidential Medal of Honor um, or Medal of Freedom, not from this administration, but um, from a, a prior one and well-deserved. You know, this is now decades ago. <laughs> and then COVID hits. And um, your, obviously your leadership has just been amazing uh, during uh, COVID. Um, and, um, you know, I think you've been a, a shining light for those of us in, in our communities that have been working hard to advance science, the importance of science, the importance of epidemiology, of following data, of, of adapting to change, of caring for each other. And um, uh, without you, I think many of us would have felt really completely abandoned. Um, and uh, in, uh, um, so I, that leadership was just so strong in spite of all the adversity that you faced. So we, we really do thank you for that. The award itself, we can't, I, I can't hand it to you right now, but, uh, oh, and you can't even see it unless I put it in front of myself because of the, of the uh, uh, Zoom stuff, but this is it. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a miniature of a, of a sculpture by uh, Seymour Lipton, um, who, uh, um, and the, the, the original is in our atrium. It's about seven feet tall. Um, and it's, it's called Pioneer. And I'll just read to you what it, what it says on the bottom. Uh, it says, you know, to Anthony uh, Bouchy, MD, um, this model of Pioneer, a sculpture created by Seymour Lipton in 1957, represents your spirit of innovation and celebrates your extraordinary contributions to advancing health. So it, it is a wonderful thing that still meets the, the uh, uh, restrictions by NIH in terms of receiving gifts, but it's a precious thing that's in the mail now to, um, uh, to you. Um, so with that, I want to go ahead and start the question. So we had, we had a huge number of questions that were asked by our community um, in the, in the on, online now, both uh, um, on YouTube, also on Zoom. Um, we have uh, over 3,000 folks. Um, so I, I tried to, you, you get asked a lot of questions over and over again, and those are good questions to get out into the public, but we wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about maybe some things that you're thinking about and that we're thinking about that cut beyond COVID, but also get to what you're experiencing. So, um, so I, 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 wanna, I wanna start with just fame. <laughs> so you've become an icon for, for, for science, for, for health, for medicine, for a positive outlook. I mean, I, it even goes so far as, you know, my, this is my favorite uh, uh, Christmas present is my uh, Saint Fauci candle. Well, I, I, I hope it's not too sacrilegious. I mean, it was a gift and, um, and I, I was just recently watching that the new Tiger uh, series on, on HBO and thinking about the, the heaviness of, of, of fame and, what, and the pressures that it puts on you. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? How's, how's that going? Well, uh Clay, thank you very, very much for that very, really kind introduction. I, I have to just comment how, how honored and humbled I am by this award from the University of Texas' Austin Dell Medical School. And to see Ken uh, on the Zoom, one of the boxes, it was really, really terrific. Uh, Ken and I are old friends. As you mentioned very appropriately, way, way back when he was at UCLA and then at the uh, then Institute of Medicine, now National Academy of Medicine. So it's really a great pleasure. But, but to your question, it really is, you know, somewhat surrealistic. Um, and people have asked me how I've responded 
uh, to it. And I think the only way to get through this most unusual year, Clay, is to focus like a laser on the enormity of the problem that we're facing and the role that I, as a physician scientist, as a public health person, as a communicator, and as the director of the Institute that either does or funds most of the research involved in the countermeasures such as the development of a vaccine. When you focus on that, the two extremes, I mean, I think if it were all fame or all uh, attacks, then it would be something that you could put aside, but they balanced each other. <clears throat> and I think what it is, I mean, if you wanna get philosophical about it, it's a reflection of the extraordinary and unfortunate divisiveness in our society that we can't run away from, it's there. It culminated in the events that happened, the horrible, shameful events that happened in Washington, D.C on January the 6th. Um, so with regard to me, you know, on the one hand, uh, I have become for people who are thirsting for clarity, for thirsting for scientific integrity, for actions and policies based on evidence, the things that you and I and Ken have been trained for our entire medical career, there was uh, sort of a void of that which was going on because of the politicization of this. On the other side of the coin, something that I never would have imagined in my wildest dreams, that because I say things like wear a mask, do physical distancing, avoid congregate settings, that I've actually had my life threatened and my family continually harassed, including my three daughters. That is stunning that in this country, you have on the one hand, someone who's merely a physician scientist, I'm Tony Fauci, no more, no less, who become the hero to some and Satan to others. So, I mean, I think that I happen to have gotten caught up because of the visibility of what I do and the fact that I'm in, on the White House Coronavirus Task Force and I've been in a position where I had to speak up against some of the things that were misleading that made me a target on the one hand and a hero on the other. So it is just the most unusual experience, Clay. I mean, just something that's very, very difficult to describe, but I think it's reflective of the divisiveness of society. It, it personally, I mean, that's gotta be it, it's so extremely hard. It, um, you know, the people coming at you in both directions, saying how wonderful you are at the same time, saying that, that, that you are uh, the devil incarnate. And how, how do you stay sane? Do you, what do you do to take care of yourself? Are you, a, a, do you exercise or, you know, I, we had a bunch of questions about that. You getting enough sleep? <laughs> You're okay. Well, um, in the beginning, uh, when we had the big surges, of uh, cases that were dominated by the cases that exploded in the Northeastern corridor, particularly dominated by the New York City metropolitan area. When we had uh, literally task force meetings seven days a week and those press conferences that became so famous or infamous, depending upon how you looked at it, I, I was just uh, paying very little attention to my my physical and, and mental health. I was just really pushing the envelope to the point of thank goodness for my very uh, insightful uh, wife uh, who is here with me at the NIH, um, who really had to point out to me that I had really had to get sleep because uh, I was not sleeping. It was, you know, I, I, I describe it to colleagues like you and Ken is that I'm of the era of my age when for better or worse, uh, you know, I did an internship, a few years of residency and a chief residency and every single one of those was every other night and every other weekend. And you used to get exhausted. And when you would get a bunch of admissions one after the other, you just had to suck it up and do it. And that's okay if you do that for three or four days at a time, maybe a week at a time. But when you have to do it for a year at a time, it's just something that, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to describe it, but 
you get used to it. And, and I, I joke with the colleagues that I've had to deal with in the White House, you know, tongue in cheek, I would say, if you think this is bad, you should have taken a medical internship in the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but seriously, Clay, um, probably exercise is the only thing that I have. You know, I used to run through the NIH campus into, into the park every day at lunch. I don't have time to do that now, but what I do right now is do that in the evening at night. So I need to get some diffusing before I delve into the hundreds and hundreds of emails that I get and I have to address in the middle of the night. So the short answer to your question is exercise, which I've always done. I've been a marathon runner and a 10K runner. So I do that at night. Yeah, yeah, that helps me too. I'm a runner. No more marathons for me, but- uh, uh, Or for me, or for yeah. me. <laughs> um, so the um, communication has been so important. And that, that's one of the things that you've really brought that's been wonderful um, to, to this whole thing. And um, communication has been an important issue, not just now has been a major issue, for example, with the anthrax episodes after 9-11 as well, which you were in key to. Um, how, I mean, one could say that this has been a communication disaster, um, uh, conflicting information, uh, denials, people ultimately believing what they wanna believe. Um, internet obviously is critical to that, but what, what are lessons that we can learn in this new environment? How can, how, can the Biden administration do something different? Or is it at that level that we need to make changes to improve the quality of, of communications? Well, you know, communications, as we found out, it has really changed uh, in the era of the 24 hour news cycle and social media, uh, because anything can be distorted and develop a life of its own of distortion and untruth. I'm not so sure, uh, Clay, what we can do about that, except try to be as consistent as we possibly can and as clear as we possibly can. The bane of communication is mixed messaging because when you get mixed messages, those who want to distort can always point to the other part of the mixture of the, of the message. When you have a consistent message from leadership, from those who implement, it becomes much easier because there are no chinks in the armor, no gaps that people can capitalize on. But when you get continual mixed messages, it becomes almost impossible to really get something done that, that is not going to get distorted. All you need is one little slip from that and people will say, hey, nobody has any idea what they're talking about. And then that just feeds into the misinformation. Yeah, and that, that plays into my next question, which is, it was about policy and policies at different levels. So one of the, one of the tensions in, in our current response has been what should happen at a local level, what should happen at a state level, and what should happen at a national level. And it feels like the response has really pushed a lot of uh, decision-making, uh, a lot of policies to down to either state or local level. Um, in fact, you know, we've spent a lot of time coming up with our own policies on who should get vaccinated and when, you know, subgroups, even though this has been addressed by the CDC at a national level, each of the states has sort of rewritten us, not, not sure, you know, what the utility of that is. Um, one, on the one hand, you know, local folks know local people and are you know, able to craft responses that meet local needs. On the other hand, reinventing things that just make sense at a national level may not make sense. So what's your take on this? Did we, did we get the balance of, of national versus state and local right? Or should, should, should we push towards uh, a, a different balance as we move forward? Well, you know, looking back, I, I have always, been one of the bent that there needs to be federal involvement with respect for the federalist approach towards running our country, because there are differences among various states that require the flexibility and the creativity at the state level. 
However, if you push that to the extreme, then you get things, particularly in the context of a common denominator enemy here, which is the virus. Um, so there, there, are, there has to be some degree of direction with flexibility. There has to be a considerable amount of support uh, and there has to be a considerable amount of partnership. To say that the federal government is gonna dictate everything that's gonna happen, I don't think works because of the diversity among the states. To say to the states, you're on your own, even though the states do desire in certain things to be on their own, there has to be some commonality of direction because the states, as hard as they try, you know, often look for some sort of guidance from the federal government, but with the guidance has to come some support. So I think we have to maybe reset the balance a bit. I have always been one who feels that there needs to be a bit more collaboration and cooperation between the federal government and the states. Um, things have worked well in some respects. I mean, there have been some successes uh, in, in, in how things have run now, but I think we can improve on that by a bit closer interaction between the states and the federal government. Great, good. I, I had a little internet glitch and dropped out for a sec, but uh, um, I've got, got almost all of that. Um, uh, so public health investment. So this is a, this is a chronic issue in, in the US. Um, uh, you know, if you look at our investments in healthcare, they've, they're much larger than they are in any other, uh, in any other country. Um, but then if you look at our investments in, in public health, the public health in infrastructure, they're actually paltry. Um, and then we do gear up after uh, disasters uh, um, and concerns, and uh, we've done it, you know, uh, intermittently before, but then our preparedness structure um, is, is quickly eroded um, between these times of crisis. And, and we, we saw that, that, you know, just what, two years ago, the, some of the um, preparations put in place for pandemics were, um, were uh, dismantled. So how do, we, how do we fix that problem, uh, both in terms of core infrastructure for, for public health, but also preparedness? Well, as you don't need me to tell you this, that we are going through, without a doubt, historically, the, the most destructive pandemic of a respiratory disease in a confined period of time. I and mean, obviously HIV AIDS, when you look at the tens of millions of people who've been infected, as well as who have died over a period of now close to 40 years, it will be 40 years this summer. Um, you can't discount that, but it, it was something that was insidious and crept up on us to have such an explosive outbreak where the other day we had well over 4,000 deaths. We have now a situation where we have about 380,000 deaths, hospitals are being overrun. That is a horrible experience we're going through. It's historic, worse than anything we've seen in 102 years. I would hope, I would hope, Clay, that after this, the corporate memory would not attrit quickly. <laughs> and we would realize, as I've known of all the times that I've testified before Congress, who has been extremely generous with us, with us being the scientific and biomedical research community, that we have to be prepared for this type of thing. Because, you know, I was, I was asked multiple times at different hearings over the 36 plus years that I've been director of the Institute, what is your worst nightmare? What is the thing that keeps you up at night? My answer was unfortunately prophetic, but very consistent, would be a respiratory disease that jumps species from an animal to a human, a new virus that is highly efficient in its ability to spread by the respiratory route and has the capability of a high degree of morbidity and mortality, either on the general population or in certain selected groups. And unfortunately, now for a year, and it's probably a little bit, so today is uh, the 14th, you know, we had the first recognized case in the United States on the 21st of January. So we're almost a year 
into this now and the toll of suffering and death has been horrible. I would hope that we do not forget that and realize that we really do have to take a serious look at pandemic preparedness, including the ability to do massive testing, including the ability to re-strengthen our local public health system, which almost as a victim of our own success over the years, we've let it a trip uh, as opposed to being a robust process that can quickly jump on, the, on whatever it is is the challenge, the need to do identification, isolation, contact tracing, the need to get into the community and get people vaccinated. It's really extraordinary that we don't have that now. And hopefully the terrible experience that we've gone through over the last now almost 12 months is gonna change that. I, I hope it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, me too. Um, well, what, what about, let's, let's go to this attack on, on science. So, um, I mean, I think I, many of us were surprised at, at just um, how much science almost to its core not just was de denied specific components of science, but the approach of science was either completely misunderstood or denied. And I think it, in an educated country, it was, I think, surprising to some of us that we could, we could deviate this far and not acknowledge all the things that science has done and is doing for us all the time and sort of cast it aside. So how, how do we, how do we, um, how do we build that back up again, that trust and, and, and belief in science? Uh, you know, if I had an easy answer to that, Clay, we, we, we probably would not have gotten in, into the situation we've gotten into. It, it really is, in some respects, almost frightening. And um, it has a lot to do, I believe, with the divisiveness. And science uh, has assumed somewhat of an authoritarian aspect to it because you're dealing with facts and you're dealing with evidence. And when people have their own sets of facts and what they consider evidence, uh, which is not, um, you know, with all the conspiracy theories and the idea of fake news and science gets thrown into fake news and people are, are reluctant to take a look at evidence because they made up their own mind about things. I think science has just gotten caught up in the extraordinary divisiveness in our society, which we really do need to address. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a social scientist, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm out of my lane if I try to give an explanation for it to the depth of people who study this. And I'm humble and modest about that, but I do see it firsthand when you have evidence that is, is mind boggling. And, and the example I give to people that is, is chilling, Clay, in that when we're out there telling people to wear masks, to avoid congregate settings, to keep distance, and you're in a state, which I will not name because th then that would be nothing but, but get, you know, uh, sort of divert away from what the issue is. But there are states and cities and regions where the hospitals themselves are being overrun in the sense of you have 20 ICU beds and you have 50 ICU patients and you're bringing in nurses and, and retired healthcare professionals to take care of them. And in that environment, people still say it's a hoax and there's no such a thing as COVID-19 and it's just a conspiracy to be able to do whatever it is the latest conspiracy is. It, it, it seems to me to be unimaginable that when in your own backyard that is happening and people are dying at the tune of three to 4,000 per day, and there are still people who think it's fake and it's made up and it's a conspiracy. We have a long way to go to try and overcome that. And I think the answer is not gonna be to just blow them aside and say, you're crazy. We've got to engage and figure out what is it that separated us so profoundly? I mean, I don't have the answer. I don't know, Clay, I really don't. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's just really remarkable how humans can, can believe, you know, and what it is that pushes them to believe a certain thing. I mean, I think that's, 
one of the things that on the science side, we, we never believe anything really firmly, right? I mean, we, we're always questioning whether we have it right. We're always re-examining. We always are humbled by our, our ignorance. And, and yet so many folks now are so convinced that they're right, even when everything in reality uh, lines up against those beliefs. Um, so some of our institutions have, have come under attack as well. Um, the, the CDC, the FDA, the NIH, um, really getting sort of stuck in, in uh, uh, politicization and, and um, pulled away from the, the science at their foundation. So how, how, do, we, how do we protect these, uh, these I mean, critical, critical institutions um, uh, going forward? Is there a way to, to um, have them uh, consistently rise above the politics um, and protected from you know, the, the, the winds of change in, in, in uh, the White House? Yeah, you know, that really varies from administration to administration. Um, and, um, you know, I have now, uh, as you know, Clay, I've been at the NIH forever for multiple decades. I've been director of the Institute for almost four decades. And with each different administration, you have different styles and different uh, perceptions about what the role of the political uh, uh, enterprise is in those areas of government in which you have presidential appointees. Um, uh, to what extent should they be loyal to a president versus loyal to the situation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the area that they're responsible for? And, and, the, and the multiple areas in one particular department, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, when you're dealing with health and science, that gets tricky because, you know, science goes for evidence and facts. Uh, not politics. And uh, when you have uh, organizations like the NIH, the CDC, and FDA, they, they can be vulnerable to political uh, influence, but most of the time they're not. I mean, thank goodness, if you look at the history of those organizations, I mean, as a scientific community, we've been pretty lucky over the years, over multiple administrations, that there has not been uh, as much politicization as could have happened. So what we just need to do as a community is to stick together and stick by the principles of, of, of what's our basis. I mean, our basis is, is science and science, you know, is, is the, is the uh, collection of evidence and facts. Um, and a fact is a fact, <laughs> you can't change it. You know, we've often said you're entitled to your opinion, but not to your own set of facts. Right. I mean, a fact is a fact. And then I just think we have to be so alert, all of us in the community in almost demanding that those institutions that are responsible for the safety and the health of the American public has to rise above the usual level of political influence. And, mm -hmm. and thank goodness, it, we've been lucky that that's been the case most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. In spite of um, skirmishes. Uh, there have um, been skirmishes, right. Yeah, but uh, the, the battle has been clearly won. Um, so, uh, you know, this has been a remarkable time for science, in, on the other hand. So whereas public views of science may be very diverse, it, it, there's, I mean, no in very few other times, maybe no other time in, in our lifetimes where we've seen science move us forward dramatically and so quickly. Um, and, you know, uh, um, President Hartzell mentioned Jason McClellan, we're really, um, you know, proud of his contributions in collaboration with folks in your institute, working to, you know, identify the the uh, configuration spike uh, protein and help to uh, lay the foundation for the vaccines. But there are many, many other scientific advances that have happened. So can, can we use the, you know, the, the clear evidence that how, of how science is, is so important and uh, impactful to everyone's lives? Can we use that to build momentum? Can we create an 
you know, additional support for science going forward coming out of this? The answer is a resounding yes. And I think, and, and you bring up Jason and his collaboration when he was here at our Vaccine Research Center with Barney Graham and John Muscola and others. I mean, that's an example uh, which I, I love it because whenever people, you know, we talk about the, the interface between fundamental basic research that's done five and 10 years ago and the translation of that into an intervention that is groundbreaking. Uh, we always talk about that. I think the the marriage, which was see, is so ex exciting, you know how it happened, and it, it's not that difficult to explain to people about why we have to keep, uh, in addition to knowing that we have specific aims and goals with cancer and Alzheimer's and HIV and et cetera, et cetera, that the fundamental basic science that you support is just spectacular in how it can lead to things that a decade or two ago was unimaginable. And the unimaginable was, and some very good people came out very vocal about it when I said in January of 2020, that I feel given our technology, that it would be 12 months to 18 months that we would have a vaccine. Everybody said, oh, you're just saying that because you want more money or something. It turns out it was 11 months. <laughs> it wasn't 12 months, it was 11 months. And the reason for that was the kind of thing that is the beauty of science is that in the Vaccine Research Center, when, when Jason and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Barney Graham were working together, we had structural biologists who were using cryo-EM to try and get the right confirmation of the HIV envelope to try and induce broadly neutralizing antibodies, which are very, very difficult. And we know that you had to get the trimer of the envelope in the right confirmation to be able to trigger the kind of uh, B cell lineage response to get an HIV. Meanwhile, Bonnie Graham, who fundamentally was interested in respiratory syncytial virus for such a very long time, was saying, you know, it's very interesting but the post-fusion confirmation uh, of the proteins aren't particularly immunogenic and don't induce as good an immune response, but the pre-fusion one does, but it's unstable. So maybe we should try and stabilize it. He did. And that led to the thought, well, now that we have a coronavirus and a spike, maybe it's the same thing. And their great contribution between Jason and, and, and um, Kizzy Corbett and, and, and Bonnie and all the others and John Muscola in the Vaccine Research Center was to take what we learned from HIV in cryo-EM and apply it to a disease that's an, a, a, an extraordinary outbreak that we needed to move quickly on. And that's how we got the spike protein to be in a form that's inducing a response that is 94 to 95% efficacious in preventing human disease. Now, if ever there was an example of the role of basic biomedical research in transforming how we're responding to a historic pandemic, boy, I can't think of a better one than that. Or, or even any human, any human uh, challenge that we've confronted. Right. Has there ever been a, 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 a time in history where science has really benefited humanity in such a concrete way that, that it is so obvious. Yeah. I, well, I, uh, I, I'm sure someone will come up with one and email me and say, you missed it. But. Okay, well, maybe, but I can't <laughs> yeah, but. think of one. And I, uh, <laughs> um, and how about that? I mean, on the clinical research side, um, also really um, amazing pace uh, moving from phase one to two to three in the, in the vaccines, also other therapies, wish we had more, but at least we have some antibody therapies, also lots of wrong directions too, of course, and quick course corrections, I would say, compared to, to a normal year. So can, can we learn from that too? Can we accelerate the pace of development, not just around you know, this pandemic or future pandemics, but around you know, the therapies for cardiovascular disease yeah. and other things where we, you know, there's, equal urgency, or no, I shouldn't say equal, but similar urgency in Alzheimer's and all these other areas, and yet uh, we, our processes are extremely slow. Yeah, there, there's, so much, there's so much good news and excitement there, Clay. For example, the clinical trial networks that we set up 
way, way back in the mid to late 80s when we knew we were going to need a very, very large international networks to try and in the clinical trial, the HIV drugs that were developed, HIV vaccines, prevention networks, all of those things, we invested hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. As soon as we had COVID, together with the companies involved, we collaborated to use many of those sites, which were COVID prevention network, which were originally established for HIV prevention, vaccine, uh, ACTG, all the things that we invested, we pivoted very quickly and turned them into a clinical trial network of people who really knew what they were doing. These were people who had extensive experience in clinical trials. So instead of starting from square one, we just pivoted into COVID-19. So that was one of the things. The other thing that you mentioned is the promise now of new platform technologies, including but not exclusively mRNA, that if we can get some of the cancer vaccines and some of the vaccines against HIV or tuberculosis or malaria and use those new platform technologies, we may be able to truncate the time it takes to get vaccines for those major killers in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So I mean, one quick question, and then I'm going to hand it to Ken to, to ask the last question. So um, we're going to be out of this at some point, you know, and that you could you can give us your your prediction. We've heard them before, though. So let's just say it's a we'll get a year from now. So we're not overly optimistic. So what are you most looking forward to doing when cases are down and this is all behind us and we can all look sort of rearview mirror? What's, what's the thing that you're most looking forward to doing at that point? I'm looking forward to getting my children back <laughs> to visit me in our house. You know, I, I had a, a, a birthday just a few weeks ago and I felt strongly, my, my children who are late twenties, early thirties, three girls who uh, obviously are very sensitive given, given my age and the fact they'd have to get on an airplane to get here that they did not want to endanger me. And I wanted to practice what I preached because I was telling the rest yeah. of the world in the country, you shouldn't travel. The thing I look most forward to is having my children with me in my own house with my wife. Under, understood, I, I can hear you. All right, so I'm gonna now hand it to, uh, to the esteemed Dr. Ken Schein to, uh, to ask the last question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Tony, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as an octogenarian, I want to wish you a happy birthday and welcome to our group. Uh, I think you, you gave a nice introduction, Clay, but I would point out to you that 25 years ago, I was chair of medicine at UCLA and Tony was visiting professor. He is a superb bedside physician. I mean, with all this talk about policy and, and, and uh, so forth, it's uh, uh, very important to recognize that his roots are in taking care of patients. It's also important to point out that uh, his contribution clearly articulates the enormous overlap between clinical medicine and public health, which has historically often been thought of differently. Uh, Tony, I'm very proud of the fact that our founding Dean Clay is a neurologist, but who has much of his work is epidemiology of stroke. So he brings many of the skills of public health to our medical school. Uh, the question I wanted to ask goes back to the notion of how we're going to maintain our preparedness. Uh, Don Berwick and I chaired a working group for a year or two on preparedness, ended up writing a paper which appeared in JAMA in February of last year, ironically lamenting the lack of a plan for surge capacity, supply lines, a whole variety of workforce issues and so forth. And at the time we were trying to figure out how we were gonna get support for this long-term. I hope you're right about the fact that the impact uh, of COVID has been large enough that public policy should be influenced. But at the time we argued that 
a major catastrophe would have profound economic consequences. And we reasoned that if there were ever going to be a, a serious public-private attempt to improve preparedness, um, then this was a way to go. And I'm wondering whether the profound impacts of COVID uh, on industry, on business, is such that we could invent some new ways uh, beyond the traditional ways to support public health and preparedness, which might be useful. What are your thoughts about that? No, Ken, I think you're right on the money on that one. Uh, no pun intended about money, but you really are absolutely correct. And you know, whatever that's going to be, um, when you have preparedness, whether it's having reserve facilities to manufacture vaccines or therapeutics or what have you, there's always a concern that if you build it, you've got to keep it warm to do something. So maybe we could say, let's make the investment in whatever it is, whether that's a public health core of people who are there in the community doing things that are still needed in the community about access to people who are uh, really, in many respects, don't have access to the kind of care um, and other health issues that we need, but have them going on a daily basis, even in the absence of an outbreak, so that when an outbreak occurs, you can then switch them to doing something on an emergent level, as opposed to starting from scratch every time something like that happens. And, and one of the horrible things is the extraordinary impact that this outbreak has had on our economy to the tune of trillions of dollars. So if you take a small slice of that and say, we lost trillions and trillions of dollars here, maybe a small slice to have a readiness that's there, it's not wasted money at all. And when you're not responding to an outbreak, there are a lot of other good things that you could be doing in the community from a health standpoint. So I hope that from an economic standpoint, we realize that we could save hundreds if not billions of dollars merely by a modest investment that we sustain. And there was no better example of what we've been through over this past year. And we're still not through with it yet. We're still in the middle of it. So let's hope that the thing that you wrote uh, in JAMA is going to be taken really seriously. Well, thank you. Um, my hope is that uh, people will think broadly enough so that preparedness would also include a variety of other things, mass casualties, a, a variety of, uh, of issues, but certainly pandemics are uh, among the most threatening. Um, we're very grateful you could be with us today. Um, I have to say that, that uh, having seen the first cases of HIV, which were reported from UCLA uh, in the New England Journal, I have followed that, that activity with you for 40 years. And all you've done is grown and increased the leadership which you've shown. Uh, we, we, our paths interact when you were muzzled by the administration uh, in, the co in the anthrax uh, period right after 9-11. Um, we raised hell about uh, a public speaker. Uh, I had the privilege of testifying before Congress about the necessity for having a single knowledgeable individual of integrity who could speak to the American people when there were major catastrophes. And Chick Coop was at the table. Uh, the chairman of the committee said, didn't you think, don't you think that Dr. Shine, this should be the Surgeon General? And I said, it could be the Surgeon General if that was the person who in fact was the most knowledgeable individual who could communicate. I said, but in fact, uh, it may not be the Surgeon General. In the case of anthrax, it was clearly Tony Fauci. And the chairman turned to Chick Coop, uh, the venerable Surgeon General and said, Dr. Coop, you were Surgeon General uh, during HIV. Shouldn't it be the Surgeon General? And Chuk laughed and he said, no, Ken's right. Tony was the right person. So <laughs> I just want you to know that uh, your, your celebrity has been extraordinary. I was disappointed. 
I thought Time Magazine should have had you as man of the year, uh, but maybe next year. So again, <laughs> on behalf of the Dell Medical School, which is young but growing and doing neat and exciting things, innovating in education in the relationship of public health and, and medicine, uh, we're very grateful to you. Thank you for all that you've done for not just medicine and health uh, and people, but for society in terms of the integrity and the, and, the, and the candor and the honesty which you represent. Those are values which are critical to our society, no matter how, what area we're talking about. Those are values which you represent to the nth degree. We're very proud of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate those words. Thank you very much. And it's really such an honor to receive an award that's named after you. Really wonderful. Thank you. And thank it's you. been a great pleasure. Ken said it beautifully. I'm not going to add anything to that. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it is in the mail and um, just a small uh, token. At some point, we'd love to have you come down. Um, and uh, again, a great honor to speak with you today. Thank you very much, Clay. And thank you very much, Dr. Hartzell. I really appreciate this honor. Take care. Stay safe.